Are you considering becoming a chemical engineer? Are you wondering if it's the right fit for you? What chemical engineers do? How it is to be a chemical engineering student? Well, in this video interview replay, we're gonna be talking about all of that right now. Hey, 1% Nation, I'm Jake Voorhees, and you are watching episode 47 of the 1% Engineer Show, where we empower young engineers to rise to the top 1% of their career. If this is your first time in the channel, make sure you subscribe because I release videos on Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays for engineering student success. And if you want the 1% Engineer Kit, which is a bunch of eBooks and resume templates so that you can crush it, comment below and I'll send you a download link. And one more quick announcement guys, before we get started, you're gonna be interested in this one. I'm doing a $100 giveaway contest for hitting 1,000 subscribers, which will probably happen this weekend when this video comes out. Thank you so much, 1% Nation. I appreciate each and every one of you for watching all of my stuff for making it to now almost 50 episodes of the 1% Engineer Show. This channel, you guys, this show has reached over 30,000 views and nearly 100,000 watch time minutes. That's almost 70 days of watch time that you guys have participated in. So thank you so, so much. So if anyone in 1% Nation is interested in participating in the giveaway, comment below. And next week I'll announce more about the contest details. I wanna give a big shout out to Emily Graham who's been requesting more information on chemical engineering jobs so I'm releasing this interview a little early just for you Emily so let's not waste any more time guys and jump into this interview with Ash Norton enjoy hey 1% nation today the featured guest on our show is Ash Norton Ash thanks for being on the show how are yeah, you guys today good <laughs> yeah thanks for being here so guys Ash is a chemical engineer went to University of Cincinnati and started working for Duke Energy after she graduated and while she was there because she co-ops while she was in school, received her MBA, and as a professional, worked for Duke for seven or eight years, and now lately has started her own consulting practice, maybe on the fringes of 2016 into 2017. I know it's been, you know, you're approaching that one-year mark here coming down later throughout the year, and was lately featured in a Forbes publication. Huge congrats, Ash. I'm so happy for you about that. So... Ash, thank you again for being on the show. Why don't you yeah. say hello to 1% Nation and fill us hey, in, everybody. <laughs> fill us in yeah. with uh, some other things about your personal life outside of engineering. Yeah, so um, I met my husband uh, at Duke Energy. So I've, we've got three children. Um, my youngest is eight months old, so I'm not getting a lot of sleep now, but um, they definitely keep me hopping. Happy to be here to talk with you guys. Uh, one of my biggest passions is helping young people develop and grow, and especially young engineers. So really excited to be here. Awesome, awesome, Ash. Thank you so much. So yeah. before we talk about some of the very exciting things that you have going on in your life right now, let's go all yeah. the way back to your days when you were maybe in high school and you were trying to figure out what you wanted to study and you landed on chemical engineering. Take us to that, Ash. How did you yep. know, how did you arrive at chemical engineering for being your career? Yeah, good question. So I actually had no idea what an engineer did. Um, but my aunt said to me, hey, you should be an engineer. So I started digging into it, looking into it. Um, and I knew that I loved chemistry. So out of my high school classes, I really loved chemistry. And I had this great opportunity to take um, a couple of weeks course at Eastern Kentucky University that it was just very general engineering for high school students. Um, and so really excited about that. And I realized that I really enjoyed how engineering allowed you to apply the science. Uh, and so with that, I learned, hey, engineering really might be for me. My aunt might be on to something. Um, so with, you know, how I loved chemistry and the engineering experience that I had, that's kind of what led me to chemical engineering. Love that little little family nudge, little family advice goes a long way. Right, right? and following that heart, I yep. love that. How it's like you kind of knew. I feel the same way about civil. Kind of had it in my heart, and then when you take the classes and you explore, it just kind of starts to snowball, right? So, Ash, yep. really quickly, I mean, people know about University of Cincinnati. My biggest <laughs> connection to it is I don't remember his name, but the football coach who had that killer year and then went on. He left and then went to Notre Dame after that. Um, but for people, yeah, who, we we don't mention him too much. Yeah, I knew it. He's hated, <laughs> right? He's hated. Yeah, that's so funny. 
Um, so for everyone who may not be unfamiliar with the University of Cincinnati, take us back again to those moments where you were choosing school and why is it that you chose that school and what was it that attracted you to, to that university? It was actually my last choice when I was looking at colleges and I said, well, I'll just go ahead and apply and that way if I don't get into any of these other colleges, you know, I know I'll get in there. So that was kind of my thinking and applying. Um, but what I discovered as I looked into all of the colleges more and more, um, yes, the other colleges I looked at too, it had really great programs, but the University of Cincinnati has a stellar co-op program. And so um, that is what really solidified it for me um, was I was able to, one, earn money, um, two, find out did I enjoy engineering, and then three, kind of get some work experience under my belt before I even graduated. And so because they had such a strong uh, co-op program, that's why I ultimately really dug in and, and decided on the University of Cincinnati. Yeah, I think co-op programs are an awesome thing for students out there. I've seen the yeah. numbers for job placement rates for co-ops. I mean, you come out of school, you know people in the industry, you have experience, right? So I'm sure you encourage everyone to pursue a co-op program. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And as a hiring manager, when I'm you know, when I've in the past looked at resumes, those resumes that have experience, even as a co-op, they stand out because it's not just do you have that theoretical, you know, mental capability? It's can you apply it in a way that helps the organization? And so, you know, I encourage any engineering student to pursue a co-op or an internship, uh, even if where they're at doesn't have, you know, a solid program. Yeah, and I'm so happy that you talked about your experience as a hiring manager, Ash, because yeah. that is my next question for you. No. <laughs> but first, a lead-in question, how long were you actually working in the hiring manager type space? Yeah, so when I first graduated in 2007, I was the laboratory supervisor. And so there were a couple of um, co-ops, engineering co-ops, as well as some laboratory technicians that worked within my team. And so for three years, I was the hiring manager in that role. Uh, then I transitioned to our engineering subject matter expert role. And so I was an individual contributor. Um, however, I helped hire engineering co-ops. Uh, and so for in that role, even though they didn't report directly to me, I was their mentor. So I did that for another two years. Uh, and then I transitioned into the engineering subject matter expert manager role. And so I was in that role for three for another three years. Wow. Okay. So you're definitely an expert in this field. You have a lot of knowledge about what it takes to stand out for an engineering hiring team, what they're looking for, mm -hmm. what may be some red yeah. flags. This is great. So this is my next question for you, Ash, is maybe if you could scan back through all that experience, I'd love to talk about two things within that. What, okay. what to you are the key things, whether you be a co-op student or just an engineering student in general, what are the key ingredients that you need to make sure you are producing th things that you are getting involved with to stand out in order to actually be the person that gets that interview? What are like the core, okay. core things these students can do? Yeah, so really good question. Um, the first one would be any sort of co-op or internship. So something that has direct engineering applicability. Um, also, don't underestimate some of the extracurriculars. So any way that you can demonstrate that um, you can work as a team, that you can um, apply your skills. Um, for our industry at Duke Energy, a lot of our engineering co-ops and then engineers worked at our power plants. And so actually any sort of mechanical aptitude, um, if, you know, working on race cars was a hobby, like that's actually something that would stand out for us. Um, maybe working in a farming environment where um, you have to understand how a tractor works and how that equipment works, any sort of mechanical aptitude, that would help for my industry. So I would look at what's a skill that would help you apply it, even if it's not directly, I worked in a power plant, you know, what are the skills that would 
you know, help you work in that way. Build up some applicable skills, 1% Nation. Yeah. That's what's going to take it for you to stand out. That's what it's going to take yeah. for you to stand out. Excuse me. So this is really good. And really quickly, Ash, because I know these are going to stand out like vibrant memories. Maybe walk us through a couple of the big no-nos in terms of resume or cover letters or cold emailing, whatever, whatever it may be. But what are some things that we should avoid as engineering students seeking that full-time job? Yeah, good question. Um, so double, 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 triple, quadruple check your resume. Make sure that there are no grammatical errors because um, no, you're not going to be in the you know, your full-time job judged on, you know, can you spell correctly? Can you do all that? But um, it's a signal of how much do you care? How much effort have you put into it? Um, and so as a hiring manager, if you haven't demonstrated that you're really interested, um, it just kind of, you know, gives a red flag that, hey, maybe they're not that interested and I'm, I'm going to spend my time on somebody who is really interested. So that's the number one. Um, other than that, uh, it's really just about how well you can um, match what your skill set is to what what the job is. Um, and so beyond that, there's really not that many red flags. Um, you'll definitely want to include your resume, or I'm sorry, include your GPA, um, even if it's not that great, um, because if not, that kind of throws up a red flag. What are they trying to hide? So it's kind of like, are they lying by omission? Um, that, that sort of thing. So uh, don't think that you have to have, you know, 4.0 GPA um, or you're not going to be considered. Just be as transparent as possible with that. Really good. Really good. Put that GPA on the resume, 1% Nation, because it's going to give off the wrong vibe if you hide it, even if it's not the best. I did not have the best GPA. This is kind of one of the core things I teach with 1% Engineer is that it is that other side experience, the people that you know, everything else. It's not really – sometimes, you know, 3.8 – 4.0, these are scary GPAs. 3.5, 3.6, these are awesome. Anything above 3.0, so. Yeah, and, it, and to that point, if there was someone who has a 3.2 GPA and really get great experience outside of that, um, I would weigh that more heavily than someone who has a 3.9 GPA, but they don't, they haven't demonstrated in any way that they can apply that because it really comes down to what value you're going to add to an organization. And so if you've, even if your GPA isn't the best, if you can apply what you do know in a way that's going to help the organization, that's going to help you stand out. Really good. Really great advice, Ash. Thank you so much for that. Going back in time for during your career and using that expertise to help the world now. And I'm sure that's what you're doing with your consulting practice as well. And we're going to get into that really quickly. But I want to talk a little bit about your knowledge in chemical engineering career pathways. I'm happy to say that you are the first chemical engineer to weigh in and provide insight to 1% Nation. We've had robotics engineers. We've had electricals, mechanicals, civils, environmentals, PhD bridge people. And you are the first chemical engineer to enlighten us. So... I've really only had, despite going to University of Delaware, which it's the home of the DuPont family, and they have really cranked money into the chemical engineering area, um, I actually don't have too much awareness of the options within chemical engineering. So I'd love to hear from you. What are the sort of pillars of career options for chemical engineers that you know you had to sift through in your mind, figure out yeah. what was going to be for you? Yeah. So. Um there, there are lots of different options. Um, so I'll start off by saying that um, one is going to be like oil and gas. One of my colleagues, um, a couple of my colleagues actually worked for Marathon uh, upon graduating. So that's a big one. Um, any sort of manufacturing, especially um, if there's a chemical component to that, uh, Toyota, that's another big one. So anything in the automotive industry. Um, so with pigments and um that. So manufacturing is a big one. Um, a couple of friends actually graduated and have worked for L'Oreal. And so, um, you know, beauty and there's, there's a lot of formulation that goes into that. And so that's a really fun one. Um, pharmaceuticals. A couple of colleagues have worked uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, P&G. 
that's another big one. So um, how do you improve products in a way that uh, makes it so that they're really marketable? Uh, so P&G is a fun one. Uh, and then a couple of people have worked on um, kind of consulting organizations that work with these other companies. And so they'll do consulting work that allows them to work with multiple of these. So in addition to uh, my own experience kind of uh, in the process improvement side of uh, working with the power plants, that's another one. And em environmental is a big one for chemical engineers as well. Lots of options out there for you guys, and you should, yeah. should be rewarded with awesome career options as chemical engineering because I'm a firm believer that any engineering is the hardest undergraduate major that you can do. And I've always talked about how I believe chemical engineering is the most challenging one. So if you can survive <laughs> university <laughs> and with a chemical engineering degree, it seems like you have a plethora of awesome options at your fingertips. So I'm happy to hear that, Ash. I appreciate that. For, for me personally, I enjoyed chemistry so much that um, I honestly think that electrical or mechanical or, you know, some of the other ones would have been more challenging for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, like you said, any engineering curriculum is going to be challenging. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I totally agree. That's that's why I tell people we're starting to split hairs here. When people are like, right. "Oh, <laughs> isn't is it like mechanical a little easier than electrical?" and it's like, "Well, yeah, maybe not. They're all right. really hard, guys. Like, come on." Yeah. Okay, Ash. Now we're going to get into my favorite type of topics, which is you right. transitioning your career. Okay into pushing your consulting brand and putting out content and being in Forbes lately. Let's talk about what made you want to do that. Let's walk us through the story of, of the last year or so of you building your own brand and starting your own business. Oh, good. Um, so about uh, two years ago, I uh, started within Duke Energy working on engineering development. And so I started learning more and more um, officially about how do we train engineers and how do we help engineers grow. So I had done, you know, obviously as a hiring manager, I've had engineers and engineering co-ops work for me for several years. And so um, I had had a lot of success with developing and mentoring and, and managing um, people from early on in their career and kind of working their way up. So I was tapped about two years ago uh, from, you know, some of the senior leadership at Duke Energy to say, okay, let's put a program in place and, and really put some organization so that everything that I was doing in my own little bubble, we could spread to the rest of the organization. And so um, I worked on an engineering development program for about 400 engineers. Uh, and so that was something that I worked on for about a year. Um, and that role was then um, kind of disbanded and I was offered a severance. And so even though I loved working with Duke Energy, um, I was eight months pregnant at the time. And I said, okay, the universe is telling me something. Um, I've always kind of in the back of my mind considered doing something on my own, having my own business, um, and the opportunity to help more and more engineers. Um, so that's something that the stars kind of aligned. And I said, I pulled the trigger and said, yep, let's, let's go for it. So uh, I took the severance. And since um, the end of November of last year, I've been kind of working on, you know, building all of this. And that's kind of where I'm at today is, you know, just recently had an article um, that I contributed to for Forbes. So that was, yeah, that was big time for me. <laughs> that is killer. Again, congratulations on that, Ash, Thank because you. it doesn't get much bigger in terms of a brand like Forbes. So I just know how you felt yeah. when that thing came out. Yeah. It was about a week ago, <laughs> right? Last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was. I think it was Saturday because I wasn't exactly sure what day it was going to go live. So obviously, I had contributed to it beforehand. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just just dropped on Saturday morning, and I got the email, and I was like, "Whoa, doing family stuff!" But I got to get this out. So I was frantically, yeah, you know, <laughs> yep. hitting the the post button for that yeah. one. Yeah, I saw it go on LinkedIn and shared it to uh, the One Percent Engineer Facebook group right away, yeah. and that's Thank all you. you shared it. And I'm just like, wow. <laughs> she's coming on the show and I think we were already <laughs> chatting I was already chatting yep. with you about like specifically chemical engineering career guidance and yep. I was kind of already like wanting to, to get you on the show um, mm -hmm. I, I've started to do more like email little interviews because some people are honestly afraid of the camera. I knew that you wouldn't be afraid of the camera, so I don't always ask right away, but I'm super happy to have you yeah. on the show now and especially in this moment, right? Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so the 
Forbes article, what I was extra excited about was it focused on soft skills for um, technical people. So for me, you know, I focus on engineers, but soft skills for engineers, I think, is so, so critical. Um, and so speaking on camera, like, obviously, there's, you, I could be just really nervous. And, but one, I know that things won't go perfectly, and that's okay. Um, so yeah, just continuing to develop those soft skills is so critical. So hopefully, I'm setting a good example and um, just jumping in with, with being on camera. Yeah, no, you're rocking it out, Ash. And I'm so happy that you mentioned the topic of that article because this is the epitome of the 1% Engineer Society. This is what I talk about. I don't talk about how to actually get good grades necessarily. Like there's so much content out there about how to get a high GPA and how to be a good student and things like that. But really, it's those soft skills. It's your communication. It's your networking. It's your empathy. It's your relationship building. That's what's going to make you successful. So I'm super happy that you brought yeah. that up. And the way that I think about it is, so all of those technical skills, yes, you absolutely have to have them. Um but your soft skills, they're really the vehicle that allows you to apply them. So um, I've met engineers who were way smarter than I was, you know, just way smarter, but they weren't gaining as much traction as I was because they weren't utilizing all of these other skills to influence and build relationships and apply their knowledge. And so um, I really think of the soft skills as the vehicle to apply your technical skills. No, you're not an engineer if you don't have those technical skills, um, but you're not a really good engineer if you don't have the soft skills too. Love that. 1% Nation, let your soft skills be the vehicle to success. That's what you guys yeah. need to do. Great, Ash. And really quickly, how did you get connected to the Forbes writer? And I love, I, just me personally, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and the way that um, I've approached this, it's really been the same with any sort of relationship building. Um, it's so, so important to start small. So I didn't just reach out to somebody at Forbes and say, hey, let's do this article. Like, they're going to say, um, who are you? I don't care. Go away. Mm -hmm. Like, then I'm just somebody who's asking, 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 asking. So Anytime you want to build relationships with somebody who's influential, who maybe it's senior leadership, maybe it's just um, an engineer who has been doing, you know, what they're doing for 20 years. Maybe it's an industry expert. Um, the way you go about it is by starting small. So first, you just follow them. Um, if it's somebody online, then you follow them. You like them on you know, every platform that makes sense. Um, then you kind of walk through and you share their stuff. You comment on their stuff. You engage them. Um, and so that's the way that I did it with this. So um, there were a couple of um, authors on Forbes and a couple other magazines that I really enjoyed their content. I thought it was a good fit. And so I started building a relationship with them. Um, and one thing that I've actually done for... Uh, 1% Nation, for you guys, I've created a tracker um, to help kind of walk you through the steps of building those relationships with the influencers. Um, and so I've created that, a free download. Um, you can get it at ashnorton.com slash 1% Nation. So written out, or I'm sorry, 1% Engineer written out. Um, so you can get that there, but basically just step by step, build the relationship. And I've done it, you know, to get you know, be a contributor for Forbes, um, but it's the same with building relationships with senior leadership within your organization. So it's really um, kind of the basis of how you do anything with, with building this sort of success. Download that tracker, 1% Nation. And thank you so much, yeah. Ash, for doing that. I'm okay. going to personally check yeah. out that tracker myself and start using it in 1% Nation. Yeah. You should check that out as well. That's really good. I love, I love all those tips about using social media to biz dev and network and it's pretty good um yeah you know about gary vaynerchuk i'm sure you do yeah yeah yeah, yeah this is the type of stuff that he talks about so much it's okay. really like start with the likes follow them engage send them an email send them a dm don't ask for anything i loved your article on this i loved your article on that and then maybe even mm -hmm. offer to write some content for them i'm sure you've done that along right. the way as well 
Well, so, and the thing is, if you if you take it slow and really do it authentically, then when it comes time to make the ask or make the pitch, you already have the relationship. You don't feel, you know, sleazy or slimy about it because you've already contributed so much. Um, and what I found is that when you really invest in those relationships, um, it's not very often that you get told no. Um, and if you do get told no, a lot of times it's not yet. It's not, you know, a hard no. It's, you know, I've got these other things going on right now, but you know, in a couple of weeks or a couple of months or a year, then those relationships, you know, come back. That's what, that's really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. I love that. Let me see if I can put, pick it up. Yep, here it is. This is what they talk about, the thank you economy. So by the okay. time you're ready for that ask, it is just yeah. primed and ready. And it's like, oh, well, you know, we've built this relationship for so long. And like you said, usually it is an ask. And if it isn't, then it's just not the right timing. It's an ask. It's not a take, right? You can't have that expectation. Yeah. So I love that. So Ash, before I forget, I do want to ask you a little bit about your MBA. Let's uh, shift gears here. Yeah. And if you believe that that has helped you in terms of having the confidence to start your business, or if you learned some things that helped you at Duke or things like this, is that something you would suggest to the young engineers out there? Yeah. So I get this question a lot, um, both for the e uh, MBA and whether or not the engineer should pursue their PE. Um, my number one suggestion is be pursuing something. So decide which one is going to benefit you the most in your career, which path would you like to take, um, but don't sit back and don't do anything. So I really believe that once you dig in or, you know, in our full-time engineer, that you're pursuing something, um, PE, MBA, maybe it's some other sort of development and leadership. So number one, be pursuing something. Um, for me, the MBA made the, made the most sense because um, I was already on a management track. Um, I was already kind of focused on being a leader in kind of the, you know, technical world. Uh, and so for me, that made sense. Um, it was also really, really nice for me that a bonus that I didn't expect was that I learned so much about the way other organizations did things. Um, as I mentioned, all of my uh, co-ops and, you know, my work experience to that point had been with Duke Energy. That was the, the only company that I had kind of intimate knowledge of how they operated. And so by pursuing my MBA, I really got the chance to learn so much about all of these other organizations. And so for me, that that was an added bonus that I didn't even expect. Um, but then I also learned just so much just business knowledge of, you know, I didn't have to take accounting or economics or any of those courses um, for my undergraduate. And so it was really good to kind of explore the ins and outs of uh, that type of um, curriculum, you know, so that I could apply that to real world. Love that. I love that. Thank you so much, Ash, for all that MBA insight. I went yeah. to a technical master's program after undergraduate and it only took me three, four, five months to realize like hmm, I probably should have <laughs> pursued MBA. It just seemed like a better fit for me. So uh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you can fill us in on some of that. So yeah. Ash, we have been very good at being concise here tonight, this evening, <laughs> and have gone through all of the core questions that I wanted you to fill in some tidbits, some value bombs onto 1% Nation. But I have yeah. a few 1% lightning round questions for you, all right. if you're ready for the 1% round. Right. Usually, Shoot. Yeah, usually I do <laughs> five, but I think I'm only going to save it to my top three. So, okay. In your life, you can have it be connected to engineering, being a student, whatever. What is the biggest piece of advice you've ever received? Ooh. I think the thing that helped me has helped me so much um, because I tend to um, be a worrier. I tend to care so much about what's going on and put so much energy and passion and, and heart into it. Um, that sometimes I get disappointed. And so for me, the best piece of advice is if it's not going to matter in five years, don't worry about it for five minutes. And so if it's, you know, if it's not going to be something that matters in five years, don't even let yourself spend five minutes on it. Um, so that's something that helps uh, keep things into perspective for me. That's really good. I feel like I could use that yeah. if I look back on my life. Is this going to matter in five years, Jake? No, forget about it. Love that. Right. <laughs> yep. Just move on. What's the number one book recommendation that you have for 1% Nation? 
Yeah. Um, for me, this is uh, the number one book recommendation for everyone, uh, but Strengths Finders 2.0. And I say that because, especially for engineers, we know our skills very well. We are very competent, capable people, and we know our skills very well, uh, but we maybe haven't focused as much on what our natural strengths are. And so for me, I was, um, my eyes were just opened so much when I read that book and, and took the uh, quiz that comes along with it to identify my natural strengths. And it really helped me see um, how I can apply my natural strengths uh, and be a better leader, be a better engineer. And what's really great about it is they give some really practical tips um, for how to apply your strengths. And so, you know, break it out, not just your skills that you've learned as an engineer, but also your natural strengths. Uh, and don't underestimate those. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of phrases like double down, triple down on your strengths and mm -hmm. don't worry about those core weaknesses as much, but connect yeah. what makes you great. If you're a good speaker, if you're a good writer, if you're a good artist, connect that in to your career yeah. and, and leverage those. Absolutely. And, okay, Ash, so this is really good. Let's let us maybe walk through in a, in 1% lightning round fashion. If, if we could learn from a mistake that you've made in your career or student journey, what would that be and how can 1% Nation learn from that? Yeah, I think for me, um, I don't really think so much about mistakes per se, um, but if I were to go back and be in college again, what would I do differently? Um, I would really pursue... Uh, additional co-op opportunities. And so I could have co-opt at multiple different companies and it really have not been a big deal. And I would have learned kind of how other organizations did things. I wouldn't have had to wait until my MBA to get that experience. Um, so that's something that if I were to go back, you know, Duke Energy was a really great company to me. Um, and so, you know, I have no issues with that, but I, I would have I think I would have been better served had I explored other career opportunities while in college. Love that. Always be looking out for opportunities, guys. Always yeah. have that on your horizon. Well, Ash, that's yep. the final question here. I'm not going to throw a couple other random lightning round questions at you <laughs> because you have done nothing but home runs here today. So thank you so much for enlightening us on your experience. Yeah filling us in on your career road, letting us know what chemical engineering is all about and the tips about how to get published in Forbes, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, Ash, thank you so much, guys. Go ahead and download her tracker. It's going to be in the first line of the description for this video, and I'll have the website there. Please go check that out. And check out Ash's website as well. I'm going to link that up. Um, can have that uh, probably in the in the first line as well because she has a free ebook when you land there and lots of cool stuff as well, guys. So yep. thank you, Ash, for your time today. Yeah. And we'll check thank you, you later. See you guys. <laughs> Hey, 1% Nation, I hope you enjoyed that interview replay with Ash Norton. If you did, comment below about what you learned and what you agreed with or disagreed with. And if you want the 1% Engineer Kit, if you want to participate in the $100 giveaway contest, comment below and I'll send you more information on that stuff. And if you're enjoying this show, guys, make sure you subscribe because I release videos on Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays so that you can crush it in your career and become a 1% Engineer.